An American Plague by Jim Murphy. Chapter 10. Impr An American Plague by Jim Murphy. Chapter 10. Improvements and the Public Gratitude. An ill name is easier given than taken away. Absalom Jones and Richard Allen. January 1794. Wednesday, January 8, 1794. If the disease has disappeared, as it no doubt has, wrote Howard in that day's general advertiser, every... every uh, An American Plague by Jim Murphy. Chapter 10. Improvements and the Public Gratitude. An ill name is easier given than taken away. Absalom Jones and Richard Allen, January 1794. Wednesday, January 8, 1794. If the disease has disappeared, as it no doubt has, wrote Howard in that day's general advertiser, every memento of its existence should disappear with it, that the citizens may once more enjoy repose. No doubt some people agreed with Howard. The danger was gone, they said, so let's forget about it completely and get back to business and life as it was before Yellow Fever's visit. This was an especially strong wish among the fugitives, who were embarrassed at having abandoned their city in its time of great need. Charles Biddle, for instance, tried to ignore the entire tragedy by insisting that those who had died were all foreign-born or strangers to the city. When asked about a dead friend who had been born and raised in the United States, Biddle explained that he hadn't really died of the fever. He had actually been frightened to death. Biddle and those who thought as he did were the exceptions. Most people, like it or not, had had their lives changed too profoundly by the fever to make believe it hadn't happened. Take the case of Dolly Payne Todd, who had lost her adoring husband John and a newborn baby son to the fever and even though she had removed herself and her two-year-old son to a farm at Gray's Ferry, they had both become infected and had been close to death themselves. Even so, Dolly returned with her mother and son to her pleasant brick home on 4th and Walnut Streets in November and began taking in gentlemen boarders to pay her bills. Dolly was no wallflower, content to spend the rest of her days living in the past. She was too intelligent, lively, and attractive for such a passive existence. Eleven months after John Todd's death, Dolly married a congressman from Virginia named James Madison. The yellow fever had certainly had a tragic impact on her life, one she would recall often in the years to come. Yet it was out of this that Dolly Madison's role in our nation's history as hostess for the widow of President Thomas Jefferson and then First Lady for her husband was born. Government also found itself changed. The Pennsylvania legislature realized that the state government had ceased to exist when its members scampered from the city in panic. They never admitted personal failure or cowardice to do so might be used against them in coming elections. Instead, they fa factored flight into the structure of the state government. In the event that yellow fever or any other natural disaster might rout them again, they gave the governor special authority to make laws and spend money until the crisis ended. The national government learned something because of the yellow fever epidemic as well. The states had worried so much about a future autocratic president that the federal government had inadvertently created a constitutional crisis for the one currently in office. To avoid repeating such an awkward and embarrassing situation, Congress passed a law giving the president power to call it into session outside of the nation's capital whenever a grave hazard to life and health existed. Changes also came to the city because of the fever. While no one knew what caused the yellow fever, the doctors agreed that foul smells were not healthy and might promote disease. Therefore, efforts were made to keep the markets and streets free of offensive smelling matter. And the laws holding homeowners responsible for cleaning up their property were strengthened. At first, these laws were rather weak and generally ignored by all, but as the 19th century went along and the link between filth and disease became more apparent, public health codes 
were strengthened and enforced. That the poorer areas of Philadelphia, those mean, narrow alleys with their run-down, airless houses had suffered the worst, did not escape attention. However, no municipal works projects, such as putting in a sewer system to eliminate the polluted sinks, were initiated to change the wretched conditions. There was no money whatsoever in the city's budget for such costly endeavors, plus no desire to undertake them. Holding down city expenditures was deemed more important at the time than public health. Instead, when the fever rampaged through Philadelphia in, sum in summers to come, vast tent encampments were erected for the poor by the Scully Kill River and in the Northern Liberties. Poor people couldn't flee to comfortable country homes like their wealthier neighbors, but at least they could escape the most squalid and plague-ridden sections of town. The biggest improvement was made in the way water was supplied to Philadelphia. In 1793, water for drinking, cooking, cleaning, and putting out fires all came from the private and public wells or from the Delaware River. Most wells were dug in the cellars or backyards of homes, usually only a few feet away from a privy pit. In addition to human waste, the byproducts from manufacturers such as tanneries and refuse from the market seeped into the drinking water. As for the Delaware, it was a handy dumping ground for anything and everything household and human waste, manufacturing rubbish, and debris from the hundreds of ships that visit the city every year. The result was evil-smelling and evil-tasting water. While the College of Physicians assured everyone that yellow fever did not originate in the water, the majority of citizens felt otherwise. If the foul smell of rotting coffee could cause health problems, they reasoned, why couldn't foul-smelling water? Complaints about the water and its link to yellow fever increased with each new visitation until action was finally taken in 1799. That was when the city hired Benjamin Latrobe to design and construct Philadelphia's first waterworks. Water was lifted by a steam engine pump from the Scully Kill River, which was then purer than the Delaware, and forced along a tunnel to the central pump house. Located in the large central square at Broad and High Streets, just two blocks from Ricketts Circus, there another steam engine pump lifted the water into huge wood reservoirs from where it was fed by gravity to households and businesses around the city. Water from the system, the first water system in the United States, was sweeter tasting and had no offensive odor. Plus, the water flowed with enough force to hose streets and docks clean and to flush open clogged sewers, eliminating the back-breaking need to hand pump, hand pump every drop of water had another beneficial effect as well. People began to bathe more often. Elizabeth Drinker took a bath in 1799, a full 28 years after her previous bath. Even President Washington learned a valuable lesson as a result of his encounter with yellow fever. The president had enjoyed his stay at David Deschler's comfortable, rambling home in Germantown during the autumn of 1793. When yellow fever returned to Philadelphia the next summer, Washington wasted no time in removing Martha, himself, and the rest of his household, along with his official papers, to that safe location again. This became the nation's first summer White House. The presidents ever since have followed the tradition by establishing their own warm-weather residences. As for Washington's French problem, the fever had an impact on it as well. Genet had fled Philadelphia and its epidemic for Manhattan in September, but the passion surrounding him and the Neutrality Act seemed to have died along the way. His reception in Manhattan was tepid. Meanwhile, his supporters in Philadelphia had their minds on survival, not politics. In time, the French government, prompted by complaints from the United States, replaced Genet with a new minister who brought along orders for Genet's arrest. The tensions between the United States and France would linger for years, but the immediate crisis ended. Years later, John Adams would recall the street riots outside George Washington's residence. The coolest and the firmest minds have given their opinion to me that nothing but the yellow fever could have saved the United States from a total revolution of government. No, the memory of the yellow fever wouldn't disappear as easily as Howard demanded. Besides, some people just wouldn't let it fade from their memory. The doctors, for instance, were still disputing. One of the first things Governor Mifflin did when he returned in late October 
was to ask the College of Physicians to write a report concerning the cause of the disease, as requested the College assembled. But the veneer of mutual respect and consideration had worn very thin. Physicians had been forced to take sides during the fever when the squabbles hit the newspapers. They came to the meeting with their opinions fixed. Instead of a careful discussion of the disease, the physicians bickered and fought. The doctors, holding that the fever had been imported, won out simply because there were more of them. To the delight of Governor Mifflin and Philadelphia businessmen, the college declared, no instance has ever occurred of the disease called yellow fever having originated in this city or in any other parts of the United States. Rush was incensed at what he viewed as flawed medical logic and professional jealousy, and promptly resigned from the College of Physicians. One of the few doctors who had not quarreled with Rush tried to persuade him to reconsider. Oh, my friend, wrote Dr. Samuel Griffiths, search and see if our resentments are to make us quit places where we can imminently be useful. But Rush's mind was made up, and everyone knew what that meant. He would not back down. In fact, he was seriously thinking of leaving Philadelphia and the practice of medicine altogether. The envy and hatred of my brethren has lately risen to a rage, Rush explained. They blush at their mistakes. They feel for their murders, and instead of asking forgiveness of the public for them, vent all of their guilty shame and madness upon the man who convicted them of both. In the end, Rush stayed in the city and reestablished a strong medical practice, so he never attended another ga gathering at the college. But the controversy persisted. Many doctors took up the pen in order to write about their experiences during the plague, as well as to argue in support of whichever treatment they favored. And so, from the pages of the newspaper to the pages of books, the accusations and name-calling raged on. Actually, the writing began long before the deadly fever disappeared. Dr. William Curry's 64-page a description of the malignant infectious fever prevailing at present in Philadelphia appeared at the beginning of September when the fever was confined to a few streets and alleys. It was the first book on Philadelphia's plague, and while Curry did not call it yellow fever, his description of the fever symptoms is detailed and accurate. Other physicians follow Curry's lead with David Nassi, John DeVees, Isaac Cathrall, Nathaniel Potter, and of course, Benjamin Rush publishing books in the weeks and years to come. The entire controversy re-erupted whenever yellow fever appeared again in the city, as it did in 1794, 1796, 1797, and 1798. Rush bled and purged aggressively and argued for his cure each time. Other doctors hotly argued against it and him. In 1797, Rush's opponents were joined by a new and highly virulent voice, that of, jour of journalist William Cobbett. Cobbett was an Englishman who had been driven from the homeland because of his attacks on corruption in the English army. He despised those American colonials who had fought against his England. Yet he still chose to settle in Philadelphia where he set up a royalist newspaper called the Porcupine's Gazette. Cobbett hated Rush because of Rush's prominent connection to the revolution and his beliefs in representative government. He has long, very long, been employed in scuffling up his little hillock of fame. I will down him, Cobbett promised, and attacked Rush in prose and verse in just about every issue of his paper. Blood, blood. Still they cry more blood. He wrote about Rush and his followers. In every sentence they menace our poor veins. Their language is frightful to the ears of the alarmed multitude as the ravens croak to those of the sickly flock. Even in an era when newspapers were often attacked political enemies ruthlessly, Cobbett's attackers were particularly vicious and personal. He called Rush a quack and a murderer and even suggested the doctor was mentally unstable. Before the yellow fever epidemic, even the doctors who disagreed with Rush on medical matters would have defended him against Cobbett's irrational assaults. But the infighting had taken such a nasty turn during the fever thanks largely to Rush's aggressive personality, that he was forced to defend himself on his own. Rush stood the abuse for as long as possible, then moved to Princeton to find some peace. Cobbett continued his anti-Rush ravings anyway. When Rush applied for a position at the medical faculty of Columbia University in New York City, his appointment was blocked by another enemy of his cure, Alexander Hamilton. Rush once again vowed to retire, but decided to regain his good name before doing so.
He sued Cobbett for libel, and after a long and public trial in 1800, the jury awarded Rush $5,000 plus $3,000 court cost. Instead of paying, Cobbett fled Philadelphia and then the country. Some of Cobbett's personal possessions were sold, and Rush donated the money to charity. The victory was enough to lure him from retirement a second time, but his reputation was forever char tarnished. He spent the remaining 13 years of his life curing diseases and battling opponents with his customary stubborn ferocity. Many of Philadelphia's most pious citizens would not let the fever disappear entire entirely either. This group included Elhanan Winchester Samuel Stearns and the Reverend J. Henry C. Helmuth. The terrible visitation, they argued, had been a warning from the Almighty to mend the city's spiritual ways. Samuel Stearns summed up their feelings in a bit of awkward verse. This mortal plague at thy command, and thou thereby hast humbled sinful man. These spiritual guardians were shocked when people in Philadelphia ignored the obvious lessons and began living as they had before the visitation. How soon after were the playhouses opened and other scenes of amusement? Winchester noted with disgust, adding a warning, I tell you, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Numerous citizens agreed with such alarming views, but certainly not a majority of the people. Most knew in their hearts that they would never completely forget the terrible weeks when illnesses had taken hold of their city and killed friends and family members, but they weren't about to blame themselves for the tragedy. What happened to the heroes of the epidemic? Those on the committee received due praise from the returning council members and from the state legislature, but voices of criticism were also heard. In December, anonymous letter writers to the Federal Gazette condemned the committee members for seizing power so arrogantly. The bulk of them, one critic said disparagingly, are scarcely known beyond the smoke of their own chimneys. The committee counted up the money it it had spent and subtracted the many donations that had come in from cities like New York, Baltimore, and Boston. It had spent $3,245.12, more than it had taken in. The deficit remained the personal responsibility of the members of the committee, with chairmaker John Letchworth required to pay a little over one pound, a substantial sum at the time, as his share. Most likely, the few wealthier members of the committee, such as Matthew Clarkson, Stephen Gerard, and Israel Israel, shouldered the greatest part of the debt. After this, most committee members simply went back to their old occupations, happy to give up the positions of power they had held during the terrible time of death and sickness. Israel Israel did not choose to step aside and let the workings of the city government continue as usual. He ran for the Pennsylvania State Legislature three times in 1793, 1795, and 1797. Each time his campaign stressed his commitment to the poor and the fact that the government in Philadelphia was controlled by a wealthy few who tended to disregard the welfare of its less fortunate citizens. Hire more scavengers to clean up the tiny and forgotten alleys, he recommended. Pave the streets and put in sewers to drain off excess water. Israel lost in his first two bids. But the vote for the third election happened during the 1797 recurrence of yellow fever when most well-to-do citizens had left the city. Israel won the election by a slim margin of 38 votes out of 4,010 cast. His opponent, Benjamin R. Morgan, denounced the results, saying the fever had driven respectable inhabitants out of town. Morgan petitioned the state senate, arguing that Israel's election was illegal because people from the two poorest sections of town had been allowed to vote without proving they had taken an oath of allegiance. The oath had been instituted by the state after the Revolutionary War to weed out anyone who might want to see the British back in power. Although the law remained on the books, taking the oath had not been a voting requirement since 1790. But that didn't matter to the Senate. It ordered a re-election at the end of February 1798. Needless to say, the re-election became a war of words in the newspapers. A backer of Israel who called himself a friend of justice argued that if the oath were uniformly required, not a single legislator could claim to be legally elected. Another signed his name as a Republican and said Israel's election had been put aside only because he was a zealous defender of and advocate for liberty and equality amongst men. Disapproving of all distinctions, titles, and every other political measure, 
which lays a burden on the common and poor people for the benefit of the rich. Morgan supporters, one of whom was a prickly publisher of the Porcupine's Gazette, William Cobbett, fired back, warning that the hour of danger is come, our government and laws totter under the unremitting exertions of ruffians panting for tumult, plunder, and bloodshed, and in hellish anticipation that they view your property as already their own. Over 8,700 ballots were cast in the re-election, and this time Benjamin Morgan won by 357 votes. The deciding votes came from the Quakers, among Philadelphia's most prosperous and pious citizens, who did not want to see a grog shop man fixed in the Senate. Israel, Israel could be an important part of the power structure during times of distress, the voters seemed to be saying, but he was not welcome there when things returned to normal. As for Absalom Jones, Richard Allen, and the hundreds of other blacks who nursed the city sick, they suffered an even worse indignity. On November 13, 1793, just a few days after President Washington's early morning ride, publisher Matthew Carey issued what would become a best-selling book, a short account of the malignant fever lately prevalent in, Phil prevalent in Philadelphia. The first edition sold out in nine days, and Carey ran off a second. Seven days later, he printed a third. More editions would follow. Carey kept the type in place and ready to go, so it was fairly easy for him to make corrections and to add what he referred to as improvements. One of the most popular improvements was a necrology, a list of the names of the dead which began appearing in the third edition. Readers loved Carey's book. Its style was lively and direct. He presented the fever in all its hideousness and did not spare any details. He began by making readers face a terrible illness. About this time, the destroying scourge and malignant fever crept in among us. Then he let readers relive the mass flight from the city, see the closed shops and empty streets, and meet suffering fever victims and those who bravely stayed to help them. There were villains as well, though he did not name names. Who without horror can reflect on a husband deserting his wife? In the last agony, a wife unfeelingly abandoning her husband on his deathbed. Parents forsaking their only children. Children ungratefully flying from their parents. Masters hurrying off their faithful servants to Bush Hill, even on suspicion of fever. Servants abandoning tender and humane masters. Such generalizations offended very few readers. They did not recognize themselves or family members in those scenes. And because Carey took a rather gentle approach to the fugitives, he pointedly referred to them as friends and openly welcomed them back. He ensured that this sizable, book-loving segment of the population would not feel uncomfortable reading this text. Yet despite such a careful approach, Carey did go out of his way to vilify one segment of the population, the black volunteers. At one point in his account, he spoke about the Free African Society offering to procure nurses for the sick under the direction of Jones, Allen, and Gray. Then, without describing the daunting tasks faced by black nurses or praising them for acting fearlessly when everyone else had fled in terror, he attacked them. The great demand for nurses afforded an opportunity for imposition, Carey stated, which was eagerly seized by some of the vilest of the blacks. They extorted two, three, four, even five dollars a night for attendance. They would have been well paid by a single dollar. Some of them were even detected in plundering the houses of the sick. Carey ended this paragraph on a note of restraint, admitting that it would be wrong to call a censure on the whole for this sort of conduct because the services of Jones, Allen, and Gray and others of their color have been great and demand public gratitude. Jones and Allens were justifiably shocked and angered by Carey's comments. His condemnation was severe and wide-ranging, while his praise seemed like a grudging afterthought. Hundreds of blacks had come to their white neighbor's aid as to why not say so. And why didn't Carey praise blacks with the same ringing prose he used to praise the committee of which Carey was a member? I trust that the gratitude of the committee's fellow citizens will remain as long as the memory of their beneficent conduct, which I hope will not die with the present generation. Jones and Allen answered Carey with a book of their own, published in January 1794, a narrative of the proceedings of the black people during the late awful calamity in Philadelphia in the year 1793, and a refutation 
of some censures thrown upon them in some late publications. The narrative is not just a first-hand account of what the free black community in Philadelphia did for the sick and dying in the city. It is the very first document published in the United States in which leaders of the black community confronted an accuser directly and attempted to articulate the depth of their anger. It is a remarkable essay, tightly argued and organized, passionate and unrelenting. It begins by describing how blacks were asked to become involved in the crisis, detailing in dramatic fashion what they did. It then goes on to address and encounter every negative statement and implication made by Kerry. The charge of extortion and gouging the sick for more money was particularly painful to the two elders. Here, they pointedly reminded Carrie that when these accusations had first surfaced in September, they had been answered to everyone's satisfaction, as he, a member of the committee, should have recalled. In fact, Mayor Clarkson had agreed that the vast majority of black nurses were doing their work both competently and honestly. That some extravagant prices were paid, we admit, Jones and Allen wrote Jones and Allen. But how came they to be demanded? The answer was that white people had driven the prices higher by overbidding one another for the services of the few black nurses available. Again, this was something Jones and Allen had explained to the mayor's satisfaction and that Carrie should know about. Why didn't he mention this? What is more, they argued, we know as many whites who are guilty of taking advantage of the sick. But this is looked over while the blacks are held up to censure. They then cited examples to illustrate this point. There was an instance where five whites charged $43 to put a corpse in a coffin and haul it downstairs to a waiting wagon. It was a white nurse who stole the valuables of her two dead patients, Mr. and Mrs. Taylor, while another white nurse was discovered in a drunken stupor wearing rings that belonged to the recently dead Mrs. Maloney. There were the numerous white landlords who raised rents during the plague and even evicted tenants who could not afford the increases. Why hadn't Carrie referred to them by skin color and called them the vilest? It is a greater crime, Jones and Allen's asked, for a black to pilfer than for a white to privateer. Jones and Allen's then turned the tables on Carrie. Had Mr. Carrie been solicited to such an undertaking, what would he have demanded? Carrie, of course had been a volunteer on the committee and takes no pay for his time. But the authors of the narrative would not let him fall back on this fact. They pointed out that Carrie had fled the city for a while during the plague, then accused him of returning for the purpose of profiteering in his own way. We believe he has made more money by the sale of scraps, that is, th this book, than a dozen of the greatest extortioners among the black nurses. Further, they stated that the money their society had collected for making coffins and burying the dead has not defrayed the expense of wages which we had to pay to those whom we employed. In fact, their calculations, the Free African Society was out of pocket at least $500. At another point in his account, Carey dismissed the grave danger the black nurses had faced by saying that they did not escape the disorder. However, the number of them that were seized with it was not great, adding that those blacks who did get yellow fever were cured easily. Jones and Allen replied by saying blacks had suffered the fever to the same degree as whites, and that the nurses, despite the offensive nature of the disease and the danger, had stayed with patients at the expense of their own families. Carey was offended by the countercharges leveled at him in the narrative. He was against slavery, he would point out in the address of M. Carey to the Public, 1794, and his magazine, The American Museum, often ran anti-slavery articles that included writings by black authors, something most other journals did not do. As to leaving the city, he had done so with the permission of the mayor and had been gone only a short time to settle some business matters. Finally, he had mentioned Jones and Allen by name in his book in praise or selfless behavior. I would fain ask the reader, Carey demanded, is this the language of an enemy? Does this deserve railing or reproach? Is it honorable for Jones and Allen to repay evil for good? Individual praise wasn't what Jones and Allen had been concerned about. Blacks had offered their services as a group, and yet Carey had not bothered to praise them for this or honor them to the same degree he honored those on the committee. 
Instead, by broadly condemning black nurses, Carey put the entire black community in the hazardous state of being classed with those who are called the vilest. They were sorry, Jones and Allen had said, if their words seemed harsh or if anything they said gave offense. But when an unprovoked attempt is made to make us blacker than we are, it becomes less necessary to be overcautious on this account. They had concluded with a powerful statement of principle and self-worth. We have many unprovoked enemies, they told the reader, who begrudge us the liberty we enjoy, who are glad to hear of any complaint against our color. He is just or unjust in consequence, of which we are more earnestly endeavoring all in our power to warn, rebuke, and exhort the African friends to keep conscience void of offense towards God and man, and at the same time would not be backward to interfere when stigmas or oppression appear pointed at or attempted against them unjustly. And we are confident we shall stand justified in the sight of the candid and judicious for such conduct. Jones and Allen had framed their rebuke of Carey as carefully as possible to allow little room for him to dispute their claims. They realized that one response to their narrative would be a dismissive, it's their word against mine. To counter such a simple response and put an official seal of approval on their analysis of the situation, they ended their book with the words of someone who was both unassailable and white, Matthew Clarkson. The mayor's note to the author recognized not only Absalom Jones and Richard Allen, but all of the people who volunteered under their direction. I with cheerfulness give this testimony of my approbation of their proceedings, Clarkson wrote. Their diligence, attention, and decency of deportment afforded me at the time much satisfaction. Carey's only concession to the arguments of Jones and Allen was to add to his book a brief mention that a number of white nurses had also stolen from patients and acted badly in other ways. Again, it seemed too little and too late. The new information did not appear in the main text, only in a footnote, and only in the very last edition printed. He did not eliminate or even soften in the slightest his attack on the black nurses despite having the typesetting in his printing shop and ready for improvements. So life went on in Philadelphia. In many ways changed forever. In many ways sadly the same as before the yellow fever epidemic began. The sidewalks, shops, and taverns, churches, and theaters once again filled with people and buzzed with talk and prayer and gossip. Many had had close calls with death and seen it on a daily basis in the streets of their neighborhoods. Everyone, even those who had run from the city, considered himself or herself a survivor. They were a people left scarred, emotionally and physically. Sudden mass death had stricken their city, and they were no wiser at all about the nature of the killer. They knew only one thing for certain. When next summer's hot, humid weather returned, yellow fever might very well visit their home again 